Welcome to Inspire Campfire, a podcast where ordinary people tell their stories of extraordinary adventure. These are campfire stories meant to inspire the rest of us to light the fire within, get outside, follow our dreams, and return to tell our own stories. Ready? Let's strike the match. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Scott Wurzbacher. And today we're going to meet two adventurous business people that have beautifully combined two of my favorite things, real estate and the outdoors. For those of you that know me, you'll find out that this is a serendipitous story that's near and dear to my heart and in many ways, a close reflection of my own story. I have with me Nate Thompson and Kevin Thewison with KCN Campgrounds, an investment group that focuses on campgrounds and RV parks by acquiring the space and facilities to provide for those of us that love to spend time outdoors. Following his voice that called him to adventure, Kevin left his full-time job with the prestigious accounting firm PricewaterhouseCoopers to enter into real estate investing full-time, and he chose the unique approach of investment in campgrounds by purchasing his first RV park the Green River KOA in 2018. And within four seasons, he grew that business to nearly double the revenue and bought two more in 2020 with another of KCN's partners, Cam Bowen. Nate, who's also with us today, is an entrepreneur at heart, and he started, scaled, and sold high-tech companies in the Seattle area before following his passion for adventure, hiking, and camping to join forces with Kevin and uh, Cam at KCN. And I am really excited to share this story of how these two have beautifully combined both their passions and skills to become an important part of the outdoor industry. Kevin and Nate, welcome to the campfire. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. I am so excited to hear this story. Real estate is my day job after all. And, uh, you know, the outdoors is near and dear to my heart. So you guys have just so beautifully brought both of these together. So for listeners, what I'd like to do is if we could just start with what is KCN Campgrounds? Sure. So you did a good job of kind of summing it up, Scott, but effectively we're an outdoor hospitality uh, investment and management firm. So we uh, look at acquiring and building a portfolio of outdoor hospitality properties. And um, kind of one of the areas that we focus on is value add. So we look for properties that have um, things that we can do to improve the guest experience, uh, improve the infrastructure and the amenities at the park, and then stabilize and manage those over time with our in-house property management company. Nice. So, so is this, uh, is the term fixer upper appropriate here? It is. It's kind of the equivalent to buying the ugliest house on the block and then doing the hard work to make that one of the nicer houses on the block and renting out the house. <laughs> yeah. I love it so much. I mean, and that's the part that's, you know, very near and dear to my heart is, you know, I've had experience in, in buying fixer uppers, but it's always been residential real estate. And I just love how you guys have done this in the outdoor space. It's so cool. Um, so yeah. Um, how, how did this come to be? How did this get started? Uh, I guess that, I guess that falls on me. Uh, like you had said in your intro, um, I started my career with PwC, which, you know, for the people who know me, that always kind of is surprising. Uh, I get that uh, you don't look like an accountant very often. <laughs> um, you know, I was one of those one of those guys growing up that I never thought about the future, never really had goals. You know, you, you see people that know they want to be a doctor when they're in sixth grade. And, you know, I was a senior in college before I decided, hey, I need to figure out how I'm going to get a job. So, you know, I, I just never really thought far ahead. And, you know, my life kind of ended up, I got married young and we had a baby while I was in, in college. And all of a sudden it hit me. I, I've got to do something. I've got, I'm, I got to get a job. I got to pay for this family. And that led to business classes. And a lot of that didn't really resonate with me. Accounting did just because it was very logical. And I had a great professor that I liked. And that was really the main driver. Um, you know, my accounting 1010 professor really was the reason I ended up going into that. And, uh, you know, like most people, you're kind of taught and thought that you've got to 
take the secure path. Okay, well, what what job are you going to get? How are you going to do it? Where's that security coming from? And accounting worked well for me because I had a job offer before my senior year, and um, you know, I I knew what I was going to be doing, and that led to some great opportunities. I was able to go to London for a summer on an internship and had an amazing time there, and then we moved to to DC after I graduated and spent six years in PwC there and you know I worked really hard as anyone who knows public accounting it's it's a grind and I knew really early on that it wasn't what I wanted but I didn't know what else to do so I just kept doing it I you know I tried what all my friends and neighbors were doing I tried to go work for the FBI and my wife said no I tried to go work for the CIA and the CIA said no we don't want you and and I ended up just kind of sticking and after you know I guess six years got to a point where needed a change and that ended up being a change of scenery. And so we moved across the country to Seattle where my, uh, my wife's sister lives and we moved the only house in that zip code that we could afford and we could barely afford it. And it just happened to be about a block away from them. And um, I actually happened to be about, you know, three blocks away from Nate, although I didn't know it at the time. Um, and transferred with PwC and worked there for another four years, got to a point where I just, I couldn't do it anymore. I was kind of in a, a negative place because I just didn't care about what I was doing. I just never was able to find another option. And what really changed everything for me was there was an old college friend, one of our first you know married college couples that, that my wife and I uh, um, had spent time with when we were uh, at Utah State. And, uh, he and I hadn't talked for maybe eight years or so. And someone told me, Hey, did you hear what happened to, to so-and-so their house burned down? Mm. And, mm. and so we, we started kind of following that. They bought a motor home and went on the road for three months and just kind of did what people like me had always wanted to do. Right. Like, let's just get away. Let's go out. Let's go see the places of the country we've never been to. We'll go do all these cool things. And I was always, wanting to do that having grown up in in utah and spending a lot of time outdoors and never had that opportunity because of young family demanding career lack of motivation all that and anyway so i, I reconnected with with this friend and said hey while you're in your motorhome why don't you i know you're down in florida why don't you drive up to seattle before you go home and let's hang out so he came up and he was one of those that was always very entrepreneurial had his own businesses built them up sold them built them up sold them uh, in the construction space and and we spent some time camping while he was there and the the first thing that that he kind of told me was like you're unhappy you got to change the first thing you got to do is change your attitude and your outlook so we talked about you know having a, a positive attitude about things and how to make that work and then that led to some other conversations and then he gave me some books on real estate investing and that was the first time uh, you know, I was mid thirties. It was the first time I'd really thought about or heard about, okay, well there's passive income and active income. Mm. And that's when it really started to click. And so that led to this whole process of, okay, well, how do I do that? Well, I was not patient enough to build up a portfolio over 10 years of single family homes to be able to replace my job and quit. I had, like, I had maybe six to 12 months left before they were going to catch on to the fact that I, <laughs> I, I was done. Uh, and I, I, at that point I was, I was up for promotion to director. It was a big deal. It came with a lot of responsibility and you know, the, the idea of having to manage a book of business was just not something I wanted to do. And so I was forced to figure something out and, and that led me to this idea of, well, what if I bought one property, but instead of it being one property, it had, multiple rental units mm -hmm. and that led to mobile home parks and RV parks and quickly realized that there was a lot of opportunity in that space and that's really what I wanted to do because it allowed me to focus on a lot fewer uh, transactions but still get the same benefit and uh, ultimately that led us back to Utah. Um, we we sold our house in Seattle. That gave us the money to go out and buy a property and move and relocate. You know, things just sort of fell into place. And I found a, a KOA, Green River KOA in central Utah, and right place, right time. 
right deal, seller financing. I was able to get it for you know a, a great deal for me, um, which I wouldn't have at the time. I wouldn't have been able to get a bank loan. I tried and it didn't work. There were a lot of things that had to happen to make that uh, transaction actually close. And so we were able to do that. And this was all within the space of maybe eight months of when I first started thinking about it. Um, so we closed on that uh, that park in May of 2018. And I, I packed up my stuff and in a backpack and I moved down there and moved into one of the little hundred square foot cabins with my brother and my dog. And we ran that park that summer and my family was still up in Seattle and kind of learned the business from the ground up, right? Yeah. Cleaning toilets. Yeah. I love answering phones, all of it. I love this. I want to pause you for a sec. I, have, I just have so many questions. This is so much fun. Um, so when you bought the park, had you already left your job at PwC at that point? Uh, yes, we, we, I had it under contract to buy, uh, but I ended up quitting in early May, like first of May, and we didn't close on the park until the end of May. So there was a month where it was unsure that the deal was even going to happen. Gotcha. Yeah. And we'd already sold our house by that point. We sold our house in March. So we were essentially homeless and jobless. Yeah. And, and I, so for listeners that know me, I have to just kind of interject that point because one of the places where I connected with you was just uh, when, when I heard that part of your journey was um, working at PwC and then leaving to go into full time real estate investing. And I too um, got into real estate following a career with uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. So we definitely had that, that connection there, which was super cool. And, and it was fun to talk about that. Um, I'm curious, so maybe for listeners, go work for PwC if you want to become an, a real estate investor. So, <laughs> but um, That's exactly right. That's yeah, why I did it. Um, you were on the accounting side. I was on uh, the management consulting side, but, uh, but yeah, it's a great company and a great experience. I'm curious what you mentioned that you, some, some friends gave you some books about real estate investing. I'm wondering if there's a couple that, that stand out as, um, most memorable for you and most helpful. Well, so it, it's it's the same story that so many people will tell. And it, it for me, what it, it came down to, there were several books about just personal development and thinking positively and that, but it was it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad was the one that really kicked it off. Um, like so many people that, that read that and it gets them thinking about the different ways that you can actually do this yourself and build your own, you know, your own wealth through this type of, of asset real estate and, and do it in a way that can make a lot of money, can, can provide you that level of security, but also gives you the other aspect of you, you can free up time for other things. And it's not, it's not working necessarily for your dollars. It's, it's a lot of work to do it, to build it, but then it provides you that, you know, that passive piece of it, which, um, you know, Nate and I are not enjoying yet. We're definitely not on the passive side, but that's the ultimate goal. Um, yeah, it was, it was reading that book that, that kind of triggered everything for me. Yeah. It's so funny because in my PwC days, I spent a lot of time on airplanes and I remember being on an airplane, reading rich dad, poor dad and getting fired up to buy my first investment property. So that was, uh, yeah, it's, it's so funny. Um, great book. Um, so, so Nate, yeah. How'd you get involved? Um, well, I've been, so as you mentioned in the, in the preamble, I'm kind of a recovering technology professional slash entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, that's been my adult life per se. Um, started my first tech company here in Seattle in 1994 and have been doing that kind of ever since it's part of my DNA and brain pattern at this point, I think. Uh, but always during that time, I was doing real estate in the night. Right? It's kind of my night job, I like to say. And so I had done a number of projects, kind of single family and multifamily and later commercial and industrial. And so it's, it's, it's a different part of my brain that was always kind of active and firing um, through the last 20 odd years. Um, and a couple of years ago, um, I was down at Kevin's Green River KOA. And uh, we both have daughters um, that when he lived in Seattle, got to know each other and had kept in touch very closely. In fact, maybe even more closely after they moved back to Utah. Yeah. And so we'd be down there you know, a couple of times a year for various things and the road trip, annual road trip being one of them. And in 2021, that summer, we were at the Green River KOA 
And uh, we were with Kevin and his daughter, Joey, and had been doing fun trips out to uh, Moab for mountain biking and yeah. Archie's National Park, where we did like a midnight hike and had these great photos of the girls looking up at Delicate Arch, which is illuminated by their headlamps and just a fantastic trip. And uh, we were back at the at the KOA one, one evening and sitting around the campfire. And I was just looking around going, geez, this place is really busy. It's it's like, I think it's actually like full. And uh, talking to Kevin, you just, you know, hey, what, what, what is this? How does this whole campground thing work? Like, where do you find people to work here? And how do you advertise? And what's KOA all about? Just all those questions. So yeah. my, my kind of real estate brain started tr triggering. And uh, and by the end of the trip, we talked about maybe doing something together. Maybe not. But, you know, the idea of if you wanted to buy some additional parks, I would love to be involved in some capacity. And um, thinking about my background scaling some of the tech companies I built and sold, um, the idea was maybe we could do something like that in this particular space. Yeah. And I think it was what three or four months later, Kevin, that uh, mm -hmm. in Cam gave me a call, and we started to talk about that in earnest. And uh, and here we are. Now we've got seven KOA parks and more in the funnel. Man, that's amazing. And so I want to. I'm curious, like where, because you're you're an outdoor enthusiast, and I'm yeah, curious. In the yeah. Yes. Hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How did that, how did that factor into this whole opportunity that, that you saw? Well, it's interesting because I grew up and we would go backpacking. I grew up in California. And so we'd, we'd go to Yosemite and like down in Big Sur and all kinds of, you know, really more kind of traditional backpacking type outdoors experiences. And so I never really experienced until being at the Green River with Kevin, kind of the, the KOA or more kind of car camping mm -hmm. uh, where the campground isn't the destination necessarily. It's the location from which you go do these, you know, excursions and adventures and whatnot. And so um, in that, in that trip, I really, I loved it. We had the best time. My girls uh, had the best time. I mean, by the, by the time we were driving back, the, the conversation was how quickly can we go back and do that again? Um, and so, so that kind of triggered in my, in my mind that there's this whole other part of, uh, of outdoor recreation that that um, doesn't require you to go 50 miles you know on a single track dirt trail and set up a tent but you can actually do it in a completely different way and looking around the park the green river um i was like there are a lot of people that are that are out here and really enjoying it and and uh, from a business perspective this seems like a really viable interesting uh kind of opportunity to explore a little bit so yeah dug into it a little bit more did a lot of reading and research and by the time that Kevin and Cam uh, gave me a buzz and we all connected, um, I was like, wow, this, I think that there's something here. And yeah. so it was a pretty quick conversation thereafter. I love it. And Kevin, I want to um, ask you too about the outdoor piece. Cause I, you know, it's been a while, but I don't remember in rich dad, poor dad, him specifically talking about buying campgrounds. Like I'm pretty sure it was buying condos and houses. Yeah, it's def definitely not in there. <laughs> um, you know, it was, again, it comes down to my impatience of how do we scale this quickly and that's what led to it and then it didn't take long to realize that hey there's a great excuse here to combine work with yeah. hobbies and you know like you you know this from your time and at pwc and anyone else who's been in that world there's not a whole lot of time for that stuff and so i'd spent a, a long time not being able to get outside i grew up camping i grew up boating um, you know, spent all my summers outside and, and then that disappeared for a long time. And so what, what was great about this opportunity was we're looking at properties that are where people want to go on their vacations. So that's, that's the exciting part is if, if we're, if we're looking at a new deal, um, or even going to visit one of our properties for whatever project. That's where people are going on their summer vacations. That's where they're planning to spend their time, which means there's a reason to be there. And it just so happens that we can combine the things that we like doing with work. So, you know, if if one of the draws to to that park in general or that town or that area is, hey, there's great fishing here. OK, well, then it's my job to go out and fish so that I can tell people what it's like and I can get some pictures and. You know, I can tell my wife, yeah, that this is work. This is not, I'm not fishing for fun. I'm doing this for, this is marketing yeah. is what this is. Yeah, and I love this. I and mean, this is where it's just so awesome how you've combined, I mean, accounting, 
which, you know, it's very closely tied to investment and, and real estate and, and the outdoors. It's so awesome. I want to, I want to hear a little bit more about the business before we do though, this podcast is so much about people listening to the voice inside that calls them to adventure. And then, you know, part of that is you, you hear that voice, but you also have to have the courage to step across the threshold and actually make the jump. And both of you did that in your own way. And I just wondered, like, uh, we'll start with you, Kevin, if you could talk about like that, that sort of period of time when you actually took the leap and what that was like for you, were there fears, were there doubts, like what was going through your mind when you decided, like not even decided, but like you actually, you know, left your job and, and pulled the trigger on buying your first campground. Oh, it was terrifying. Uh, you know, I, I think back on it and I, I, sometimes to be honest, I'm surprised that I actually did it. I, I think it kind of, it must've happened accidentally because the, <laughs> the number of decisions I would have had to make to take that kind of risk at that time, it's, it's shocking to be honest. Um, but it, you know, it was a, it was a huge gamble, um, you know, trying to, trying to get a bank loan to buy a, a million dollar property when you just quit your job and you have no income or history of self-employment there's you have no resume that's uh, really hard and then at the same time trying to buy a house uh, and the bank saying well how are you going to pay for it like well, well i'm going to buy this campground here in a few weeks and then that's going to pay for it and they say hey, you, well what experience do you have running campgrounds oh i, I don't know i'll figure it out right? <laughs> it was it was it was not easy, but you know, I, I for me, I was at a point where I I didn't have a choice. I had to do something, and I had been fortunate enough to have the right support around me to make that possible. Uh, my wife and my family, they all believed in me. Said, "Yeah, if that's what you want to do, let's do it." You know, we know that you're unhappy. We know that you can't continue down this path that you're on. So let's find something else. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and that was it. Yeah. And and. The bit, I think the biggest thing for me was because of my background in accounting, because of my 10 years of auditing financial statements, I felt pretty comfortable when I looked at something that I would understand whether or not it was going to make money. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a big thing for me is, is I at least had that experience that I could draw from to say, yes, I'm comfortable with this. This is a good deal. Even if everybody around me says I'm crazy, I know I'm not crazy. Like I know it's going to work. Was there, was there, you said it must have happened accidentally. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, was there like a, a feeling or like just something that like was underlying all this where you just, you knew this, this is what you had to do, that you knew this was going to work? It, yeah, it was, it was definitely a, a feeling. I don't know that I could have pinpointed what it was. Um, but once I made the decision to start looking at other opportunities, once I came across this industry and that park in particular, um, it just all kind of clicked into place. Like this is this is going to give me the the opportunity that I want. It's it's going to allow me to move back home to Utah, where we can be by our family with aging parents. Our kids can spend time with their grandparents. Um, gives us a chance to start a new chapter in our life. And like I said, it was you know right place, right time, right numbers, right deal. Um, a lot of, a lot of good luck went into that. Um, but you know, my, I like to think that, that some of that was maybe due to some of the effort I put in on the front end, but yeah. how much yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, totally. I, yeah. I feel pretty lucky that it worked out. Absolutely. And Nate, um, what about you? Well, I, I, uh, I don't know. I've had the benefit or misfortune, I guess, of always creating my own job. And so I think I've got a, a different perspective than, than, than most. And, and I guess in that, I would say nobody, nobody has a perfect track record, right? So expect failure, um, but don't let, it, don't let it dissuade you from pursuing what it is that you want to do, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit sometime, somehow, big, small. Um, and there's always, there's always something beyond that. There's always something to learn from it. There's always a way to, to move beyond it. Um, and yeah, just don't don't let that the fear of the unknown, the fear of it not being successful, prevent you from doing what it is you believe you need to do. Um, I've, I've I've made more mistakes than most, but I'm still here, 
and uh, I'll continue to make mistakes, hopefully not the same ones. That's, that's you know, not the goal, right? But I think anytime that you're pushing and you're on the edge of your comfort zone, which, which is um, where I think, I think everybody should, should spend some time, there's going to be stuff that you learn about yourself and stuff that you learned didn't work and, and some stuff you learned that did. And that, that's a healthy part of the human experience. And I think um, it's, it sometimes can be harder to find that in a traditional day job than it is when you're out really trying to figure out what it is that you're going to do, you know, with your life and with your time and how to pay the bills. And, you know, that's even more so if you've got a family and um, yeah, don't let that stuff scare you. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's nothing better than being your own, your own boss, in my opinion. I can't I imagine that. either way. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for that. So guys, I want to get into KCN as a business. Can you talk a little bit about um, what the business looks like and, you know, what kind of staff that you have and, and maybe we can get into some of the properties that you guys own? Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump in on this. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're a startup, you know, this is kind of how we look at it as we're a small shop. Uh, you know, there's three partners and a big reason why Cam and I went to Nate a couple years ago and asked him to join was his experience in scaling. And so we've spent, uh, you know, the first year or so growing and acquiring, we bought four parks and now we're, we're focusing on, how do we build the support team, the management team, get the personnel to help us get to that next level, right? And you know, we we've been we've been involved in every detail of the business between all of us. It's it's definitely a shared responsibility. So right now we're we're small. We're we're very uh, close knit. Uh, you know, we really only have a couple of employees and a couple of key um, contracted partners um that that help but we're maybe a head count of five or six right now um and then obviously each of our parks operates on its own we've got managers on site at every park that run the day-to-day -day, and then we provide the support on the back end and you know we really rely on those park managers and our work campers at the parks to give our guests the experience that they're looking for and our job uh within kcn at the corporate level is to provide them with the tools training resources so that they can be effective in their job. Um, you know, that's that's KCN's current state. Future state, I think, looks a lot different. And that's that's what we're working towards right now. Uh, we've got some pretty lofty goals to get there and it's gonna be a, an upward climb. Um, but, you know, it's, it's fun to have this type of group and to be small for now, yeah. Uh, yeah. because like I said, there's there's nothing about the business that none of us are involved in or that we don't know to some extent. Um, but that's not sustainable as we continue to grow. Yeah. I think I think one interesting point too with respect to the headcount side of it. I think uh, KCN corporate, as Kevin put it, is what he would have categorized in one of his audits as overhead. Right. And so if you add all of the park managers and all of the employees that we have on site at the parks, uh, that number of five to seven kind of balloons up to over 150. So when we're running payroll every two weeks, it's a pretty significant um, number of folks that are on site at the parks working with yeah. guests and doing maintenance and housekeeping and whatnot. Um, and we're, we're, you know, we've, we've done a lot with a little to get to the point that we're at so far. It's been pretty exciting working with Cam and Kevin and a new partner at KCN who we might be able to touch on at some point in the podcast. Cool. Um, with respect to kind of future planning and looking at, um, you know, what are the roles that we need? When do we need them? How do we, how do we start to really grow out the corporate overhead team such that we can support going from seven parks to 10 parks to 15 to 20 to 25 to 30 as we look at our growth plan and, and what we think we need to do as far as kind of the scaffolding around the business to support that kind of growth. Yeah, that's awesome. So can you tell us about the parks that you guys currently have? Sure. So we've got seven uh, parks. Uh, currently, they're all KOA campground brand parks. So we're a, we're a, um, a franchisee uh, in this in this context. Yep. Um, so we've got three parks in Utah, Green River, Vernal, and Richfield. We've got a uh, park in Kansas, Goodland, Kansas, which is about eh, an hour and a half, two hours east of Denver. We've got a park in Sheridan, Wyoming, which is just on the uh, just across the Montana border. It's kind of nice. a, a park that a lot of people will, will go into Yellowstone uh, mm. through or from. 
Uh, then we've got a park in Wisconsin, uh, interesting location called the Wisconsin Dells, which is a, a giant tourist destination in the summer, kind of throughout the upper Midwest. Yeah. Like water park land, right? It is. It's the water, water park, park capital, capital of the world. world. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, the, the, I didn't believe it until I was there when we were doing diligence on the park. They, those water parks are insane. Um, just crazy. Really great. Really cool. But yeah. just had no idea until we were there looking at it. Um, and then the last park is in Tennessee in Sweetwater, just outside Knoxville, um, kind of on the, the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains. Nice. So what are some of your favorites, each, each of you? Oh, geez. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about this when I saw the questions, and it was really hard because each of these parks uh, has kind of a, a unique personality that um that make them different and, and special which sounds kind of kind of weird to say but um i think honestly and this may change as we continue to scale the portfolio scott but i think as of right now each of them is kind of special in different ways yeah uh, for me I, I love sheridan wyoming i love the the kind of big sky um western us kind of feel that it has it's got a giant rodeo it's very much cowboy culture we're trying to reinforce that at the park we've got um Conestega wagons as accommodations now. Cool. Um, we have a roping station. The manager of that park was a rodeo queen. Uh, Stacy hates it when we talk about that. <laughs> We're not showing uh, campers how to how to rope steer. We have a steer roping station at the park. Um, so we're really trying to kind of embrace that western western U.S. cowboy uh, cowboy vibe at that park. That's that's for that reason. That's one of my favorites. I guess if I had to pick. Yeah. How about you, Kevin? For, for me, to be honest, it just depends. Um, the, you know, the Utah parks are, are near and dear to me because it's how this all started and it's where I grew up and there's national parks and just fantastic outdoor activities to do by all of them. Um, last year, uh, for our summer family vacation, we loaded the four of us and our two dogs in our Sprinter van and we drove up and went through Yellowstone and then went over to Sheridan and we camped in the Bighorn Mountains and then spent some time at that KOA and then drove out to Wisconsin and spent some time in, at the Wisconsin Dells and, you know, I there's things to do around all of these parks and all of these areas and so for me it really just depends on what it is I want to do. Um, you know, Sweetwater's really cool for me because it's an area that I just haven't spent a lot of time. Uh, you know, I've driven through Tennessee a few times on coast to coast road trips, but you know, last fall, as we were doing diligence on that park, I got to go out for a few days and see the area, go hike around in the Great Smoky Mountains for the first time, and you know, learn about all the really cool motorcycle trails and and that whole culture in that area. Uh, it's really close to one of the largest underground lakes in the country, which Cam and I got to go tour. So, you know, it's 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 hard to say, to be honest, it's hard to say they're all fun, um, you know, and, and so depending on what kind of activities you want to do, you pick which one you want to go to. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome. I, I am um, thinking to myself, like, this is somebody that didn't know what he wanted to do and wasn't really liking his job. And now all of a sudden driving around in the Sprinter van with your family, uh, going from place to place, checking out different properties. Sounds pretty awesome to me. Yeah, it's all work. It's all work, right? Yeah, man, I love it. Fantastic. Well, um, so in, in your, is are there like, amenities at your properties that make them sort of unique to you or what's what do you guys kind of like you, you're buying properties that that could use some improvements like what are some of the kind of typical things that people could expect at your properties uh I'll, I'll, oh, go ahead kevin yeah i'll jump in on this one you can you can correct me when i go astray um you know koas like nate said all of our seven parks are koas uh we're you know we're looking at all types of opportunities as we grow but because of our our footprint in koa that's opened up those opportunities for us there the reason people know koa and the reason it has the brand awareness is that consistency and expectation so you know we have pools at all of our parks um so people know that when they get there, they can send the kids swimming. We've got Wi-Fi at all of our parks. So people who uh, need to work while they're traveling, um, they don't really have the benefit of going off grid. Yeah. So we yeah. provide that. Uh, all of our campgrounds have a store where we sell the necessities, deodorant, toothpaste, 
up to things like really cool fire pits or fancy you know, camp chairs and souvenirs and cool apparel and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and we, we provide all those amenities for, like Nate said, car camping, RVs. We've got power, water, sewer. Uh, we have everything you need uh, to, to camp. If you forget something, we can help provide all that. Um, but they're also, you know, located close to things that uh, would draw you to that area anyway. So it's a it's a little bit of a mix, but we try and be consistent with that, where we have those those basic things. So if people show up, they know that they're going to have access to that. And there'll be nice, clean restrooms. There'll be a pool they can swim in. You can buy ice cream at the end of the day and sit around the campfire. And if they forgot s'mores, we've got all that. Uh, you know, if something breaks on the RV, we probably have the parts in our store to help fix it. Nice. We try and make it easy. Yeah, I love that. What are, like, when people book with you, what are the reasons why they do? Like, wh who are your typical customers? Uh, you know, our KOAs are mostly geared towards, or historically have been geared towards RVs. Um, you know, we have a, a higher allocation of our campsites towards RVs, but each market is different. And so we have some where a lot of people are driving because it's a couple hours away from a major metro area. And so they're looking for cabins or glamping, which is gaining steam and, and becoming a bigger deal. So for example, in Wisconsin Dells, we have uh, a lot more cabins than we would at one of our other parks. Uh, whereas in Goodland, Kansas, that's kind of a stopover on your way from point A to point B. And so you're just looking for a place to hook up. So that's almost entirely RV centric. Um, you know, there, I think what, what's drawing our guests to us is, is the brand knowing what they're going to get, but also the strategic locations. Um, you know, we, we try and target properties that are going to be either on the path to something great, or they are that something great. And so that's why people are going to go there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting to do some of the recent DOA that has done recently looking at like the typical demographic, like age, age groups of the campers in 2008, I think 75% of campers were 45 plus, um, in 2020, they were 76% under 45. Mm. So, so the, the kind of the age of the average camper, although they're still spread across you know, all ages has changed quite a bit too. So thinking about ways we can, we can kind of meet everybody's needs at the parks as we're undergoing different projects and upgrades and whatnot. Well, guys, um, you know, again, part of this podcast is what happens to people when they go outside, right? It's this sort of connection with nature and just, you know, being able to find like that peace and solitude and, you know, really being able to connect, not just with nature, but with yourself. And mm -hmm you guys are providing this experience for people. And I'm just curious, like for you guys, like you're providing, like this is a business opportunity for you guys and you saw the potential in the investment of it. But, you know, I don't know if it's a side effect or if it's part of the whole thing, but you guys are providing a place for people to go do just that, which is to go connect with nature, connect with themselves, be outside. Like, how does that fit into this whole operation for you guys and what what's it like for you guys to be able to provide that for people well that's the fun part of it right because i you know we nate and i have kids that are the same age and you know we look at this and say well if i was going to go here what would i want right like what does my family want and that's part of the reason we did our road trip last year to go stay at some of our parks is let's test it out let's see what they've got you know a, bi a big focus of ours is you know, this family friendly environment, all the amenities that create for great memories, great vacations, um, that all that stuff is going to really add to the guest experience. And, you know, the ability to combine, hey, let's go out and let's go hike this slot canyon or we'll go river rafting. And we'll do this amazing outdoor adventure. And then at the end of the day, we can go back and we can relax and the kids can swim in the pool. And uh, maybe there's a, a movie that's playing, an outdoor movie at night. Um, you know, we try and give them that opportunity. Here's some great stuff you can do uh, around the area. Or, you know what, if you just want to stay here in the park, you can still enjoy the outdoors. You know, we've got, we're outside. We can provide that experience for you. And you don't have to 
you don't have to leave the park if you don't want to. I love that. I love, I love what you're providing. And uh, I also note that on your website, you guys um, ha have said that you have also incorporating fundraising for care camps uh, directly into your park operations. I just wondered if you could speak to that quickly. Sure. So, so care camps is a not-for-profit that is focused on sending kids that have cancer to uh, kind of special pediatric oncology uh, summer camps. So the fundraising that we do is kind of built into how we operate the parks. So for example, when guests call to make a reservation or are at the front desk, we have it set up that you can round up to the nearest dollar and the difference will then be a donation to care camps. Uh, we also do some different fundraisers, pancake breakfasts, ice cream socials, things that, that bring our guests together and, and, and kind of give them a chance to meet and trade stories and whatnot while they're on the road but also the benefit of that financially goes, goes to care camps. Um, that's something, you know, all of us, well, all of us within KCN, many of us in general um, have been touched by cancer in some form or fashion. I was mentioning to you earlier, Scott, my older daughter had leukemia a year and a half ago. Mm. Um, so, so everybody has, has, has had kind of brushes with, if not direct experience with cancer. And as we looked at care camps, which was affiliated and actually spun out of KOA as a KOA project a number of years ago, uh, it just really resonated with us as something that we wanted to support and really lean into. And so as we have kind of our operating procedures at each park, um, we've built into that this kind of active fundraising and, um, you know, leaning into being advocates for care camps and what it represents. So it costs about $2,000 to send uh, a child with cancer to one of these specialty uh, oncology camps for a week where they get to be a kid, they get to go fishing and do crafts and, and hang out and just you know, the, the disease kind of fades to the background and being a kid at camp kind of comes to the foreground. Um, so it's, it's, that's about the price to send it. We're hoping to send between 20 and 30 kids to camp through the efforts at the different parks fundraising this, this season. It, it, it really says a lot that you guys, I know you're early in your operations here that you guys are already incorporating um, that fundraising and providing that as well, in addition to providing great space for people to to have vacation. So definitely commend you guys for that. It, it's awesome that you're you're starting that early in the in the operations here. Um, so what are your growth plans and how can people help? Well, we're continuing to uh, acquire parks. That is part of the goal um, over the next five years. Um, so we are actively um, both reviewing parks. We have, we have several that we're in the process of getting under contract right now. That's kind of a continual exercise and effort for us. Um, and we're also continually talking with folks who are interested in investing. And so we've got an investor portal that's attached to our website, kcncampgrounds.com. Um, and we are in active conversations with a number of folks and entities kind of about our growth plans and the types of parks we're trying to buy. And, uh, and participating in those as investors as we continue to grow. So we would love to have that conversation with you or any of your listeners that would want to participate in that way. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about, a little more about um, what specifically you're looking for if people are interested? Um, yeah. So, so typically what we're looking at is um, these types of properties um, and the way that we do the financial management and the improvements upgrades, expansion, stabilization. We have kind of this phased approach that we look at each of these properties through before we buy them and make sure that they fit with what our goals are and our kind of our formula. Um, and so we look at those as anything between a seven to 10 year hold period. So these are investors that would want to be in a longer term investment. These aren't mm -hmm. you know, kind of short term flips per se. Mm -hmm. um, and we really strive to maximize these uh, properties in two different aspects. One is the operational cash flow that the park will produce year over year and see that grow over time as our improvements kind of take root and are monetized. And then over time, we'll look at you know, the seven to 10 year window, um, then selling one or all of the parks, depending on how the market has done and how those improvements have uh, kind of driven the value up. So we're, we're really focused on those two different kind of dimensions of the investment. One is short term, long term cash flow. And the other is long-term appreciation and, and capturing the benefit of that on sale. Got it. And so you said that you have this investor portal and I'll, I'll ask you again towards the end here, like how people can get in touch with you, but can you talk about the investor portal and, and how people can find out more about that piece? Yeah, sure. So at our website, which is uh, kcncampgrounds.com, 
um, there's an investor tab and that will link you into the investor page where you can sign up to be an investor. Um, and all that does really is give you access to the different deals that we're working on. That's a non-committal. Yes, I want to be an investor. Um, um, and then with that kind of uh, sign up, then you'll get alert, alerted to the different deals that we are working on as they reach the point that they're open for investment. Um, so it, it becomes a, a chance to kind of sign up, if you will, to, to understand and get, get updates on the things that we're working on and deals as they start to materialize. Uh, there's, also, there comes the there's also a button there to book a call with Kevin or myself if you'd like to talk with us directly in addition to or outside of what's available on the portal. Um, and then as a as kind of a reference point, the portal also has the original deal materials for a number of the deals we've already done. So that there's kind of a, you know, investors can do a little archeology span if they'd like on some of the things that we've worked on in the past. Nice. Yeah, it becomes a one-stop shop for everything we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, try and simplify it. Because the, the ultimate goal is we want to provide turnkey opportunities for our investors. Mm -hmm. um, that helps streamline that process, keeping everything in house, not outsourcing the actual property management and the day to day operations. You know, we we handle all that. We manage all that for our investors, which really keeps us on the hook for everything. Um, we can't punt it off to someone else. And so that's a that's a key part of the technology stack we've added this year to to help improve that. And, you know, on the fundraising side, it should provide some opportunities for us there as well. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. What uh, <laughs> Earlier in the podcast, you foreshadowed uh, something about a new partner that that we might talk about. So you want to share about that? Sure. Yeah. So we're in the process, and this this is this is going to be kind of the public announcement because we have not announced nice. this yet. Um, we're super excited over the course of the last couple of years um, for Kevin and Cam, and the last couple of years for me now. Um, we've been very involved at KOA. And we work very closely with the team there. We're one of the larger um, kind of multi-part franchisees now. And so we, we participate in a number of different things based on that. Uh, we've gotten to know their former CFO, John Burke, extremely well. Um, John was the CFO at KOA for 16 years um, and then ran finance for the franchise system for another three. So almost a 20 year veteran of KOA, kind of the leader in the campground and RV camping space. Uh, John recently retired uh, from KOA back in May, and we have the good fortune of having talked him into uh, coming and doing work with us at KCN. So um, definitely a, like an industry luminary. We're ex extremely excited to have him on the team and to benefit from his years of wisdom and knowledge and experience and his network. Um, it's a big lift for us that that uh, we get to to rub shoulders on a daily basis with John now and, and have him involved in the, the growth of our business. That's fantastic. Congratulations on that. Yeah. So guys, um, you know, in creating this business and growing this business, you, you've obviously taken a lot of risks. And I'm just curious, as we kind of wrap up here, what advice do you have for people that are inspired by your story and, and the risks that you've taken? Uh, the, the way I look at it, because I, like I mentioned before, I was always very risk averse. The stuff scared me. Um, and it, it took a long time for me to realize that there's a lot bigger risks by not doing it and you just are ignoring them. So, you know, one, once you kind of get to that point where you're thinking about it and, hey, maybe there's something else or maybe I'd like to try something, just recognize that there's risks of doing it and there's risks of not doing it. And you really just need you need to decide what you really want. Like, do you want to risk not having the things that you want in life so that you don't have to worry about failing? Or do you want to risk failing so that you can get back up and learn from it and get better and, and get that much closer to your ultimate goals? I mean, you're going to pay tuition in life one way or the other. So why not pay it as you're going down the path that's going to get you to where you really want to be? So there's risk in the doing or not doing. Or not doing. Exactly. Yeah, I, I would say kind of two things. One is as a continuation of that point, right? Which is don't be paralyzed by the fear of failure because you're going to fail. And that's a that's a a known. It will happen. And it's a matter of not letting that paralyze you from proceeding and doing the things that you want. Um, and the others enjoy it along the way. Take the time to to smell the roses, and you know, even on a bad day, you're you're doing what you want to do. Don't let that risk prevent you from being who you want to be and doing the things you want to do. Cause it, it will, 
it will happen. And to Kevin's point, um, be aware and pay attention to the signs, right? He talked about how he got green water uh, KOA, Green River, sorry, KOA. Um, and, the, you know, the universe kind of kind of created the situation in which that became possible. Um, and I think, you, you know, you got to have your antenna up and really be paying attention to the world around you because that stuff does happen, you know? And if you see it, then you can act on it, take advantage of it. Yeah, I love it. I just... I just love talking to you guys. I mean, you're in a great space. You're you're in the outdoor industry, but you're doing great business. I mean, you're just super relaxed. You're ch super chill guys. And uh, I just like hanging out with you. You know, as you guys grow this thing, it's going to get big. And at some point, Hollywood's going to find out about you too, about KCN. And they're going to want to make a movie about you. You know, and I know you have other partners, but I'm talking to you today. So I want to know for the two of you guys, when Hollywood makes your movie, who's going to be the actors that's, that are going to play you guys in your movie? Kevin, you had, a, you had an idea that you wanted to float. So knock yourself out, dude. Yeah, th this kind of stuff, I think it's better if other people choose for you. Okay. Right? Instead of being like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to pick Brad Pitt. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous, right? Um, so for, for Nate, I pick... I, I like to think of actors not as as actors themselves, but as the characters that they're playing. So for Nate, I picked the dude, Big Lebowski. Yeah, the dude. <laughs> Nate, Nate's gonna be played okay. by the dude, um, and it's gonna be perfect. You you can't tell right now because of his hat and his hair's pulled back, but I love he, he's got he's got it. This is awesome. Okay, Nate, who's gonna play Kevin? Well, Kevin Kevin would be Matthew McConaughey, I think. Nice. Okay. <laughs> The the the, vo the vocal pattern and look and and I think that the movie would be how to quit your day job, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. You answered the question. The movie's going to be called How to Quit Your Day Job, and it's going to star the dude and Matthew McConaughey. Love it. <laughs> That's going to be a great movie, you guys. I'm going to definitely watch that. Uh, I wonder if they're going to be drinking White Russians along the way. Uh huh. Totally in bathrobes. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys, if people want to find out more, you've got the investor portal, any other places that they should check out to learn more about KCN campgrounds and you guys. Yeah. So our website is kcncampgrounds.com. And then we've got social channels up as well. Um, TikTok is at KCN campgrounds. LinkedIn is KCN campgrounds. Um, and then we have a bio site, which is bio site, bio dot site slash KCN. So handful of ways there between TikTok, LinkedIn, and Biosite, and our, our website, kcncampgrounds.com. That's awesome. And we'll make sure to put all that in the show notes as well. I really appreciate you guys spending the time here with me today. And for those listening, I hope you have been inspired today as much as I have. I hope Kevin and Nate's story has encouraged you to listen to the voice inside that calls you to adventure, because we want to hear your story next. If you have a story to tell or just need a nudge to create one, please send me an email. We'd also appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word by leaving a review and sharing or tagging Inspire Campfire in your social media. And until next time, I want to encourage you to get outside. Thanks for listening. Kevin, Nate, thank you guys so much for being here today. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Scott. It's been yeah. fun.